Welcome to Highland Waves. I'm Pat Wall, your host. This morning we have a real unsolved mystery for you, our listeners. What follows is an excerpt from the book Cold Case of Portree. Portree is a village in the northern area of the Marguerite River on Cape Breton Island. Gula, get off the steps, Hattie said as she hurriedly whisked him away. He grabbed the broken arm of the old rocker. Sitting himself down by a young maple sapling, he pounded away on an old cooking pot. After a short time, Hattie hadn't noticed that the continuous drumming had ceased. Meanwhile, Lizzie was in the house frying an egg for Gula, an egg he would never eat. Gula was a nickname given to Llewellyn O. Tingley who disappeared without a trace in 1912, at age 27 months. Did he wander to the river and drown? Was it an eagle that took him to the mountain? After all, an eagle was seen flying in the vicinity where a child was heard crying that day. Was he mur murdered by a bad man in revenge for the collection of unpaid taxes? Did he get lost in the woods and searchers couldn't find him? Or was he kidnapped by the man on a red horse, seen in the area that day, and perhaps lived a full life in some distant place? Theories abound about little Gula. We're fortunate to have with us this morning Ashley Tingley, the young boy's nephew and author of the book, Cold Case of Port Three. Ashley will talk to us about the mystery. Good morning, Ashley. Good morning, Pat. Welcome to Highland Waves. Thank you. Maybe you should start by telling us about Portree in the days where you grew up. Well, Portree in the days when I grew up was a pretty remote area, I guess you could say. Um, there was just the old one-room school and a few uh, families scattered throughout the area. Um, uh, when I was a young boy, there was a fair number of children, but uh, generally, as a rule, there was just m myself and my cousin and one other boy. We used to roam around the countryside, and uh, we did the normal things, uh, coasting in the wintertime, skating on the river in the wintertime, uh, swimming in the river, rafting, fishing, and we just wandered uh, through the woodlands. So I guess one friend of mine put it this way, you had a big playground. Yeah. So that was about it. Nature was your playground. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of uh, storytelling back in those days. Uh, there were no television, uh, so I guess uh, you would sit around uh, at home and uh, listen to the old folks tell you some stories. Yes, uh, from the earliest age, I can remember listening to stories. I never really paid much attention to them, because uh, other than the ghost stories and the stories about old people and so forth. But uh, it, it 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 was our entertainment, really, uh, especially when you had company come in and. They would start telling different stories and mostly ghost stories and uh, things like that. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of fantasy and quite often fabrication and uh, fairy tales. Uh, there was one I saw in your book was called uh, something about the witch on a shingle. Do you recall anything about that? The witch on the shingle, yes. Uh, at that time, I was going to school up in Big Interval uh, at... Um, at the big interval school, the school sits, still sits there on the crossroads going across from East Big Interval Road to West Big Interval Road. Um, I used to uh, walk to school every day. My father worked, my father and mother worked in a lumber camp and uh, I, used, I was the only child 
other than the store children. There was uh, uh, five of them. And uh, at lunch hour some days, I used to go over to my Uncle Huey McKinnon's. And, of course, I've always, I had always heard about the witch of Big Interval. And uh, um, my shortcut to go from the school to uh, Uncle Huey's was through the graveyard. And, uh, of course, six years old, I think it was at the time, and, you know, your, your imagination starts to play on you. And it was a cold, windy day, and I was walking towards uh, Huey McKinnon's. And uh, I took the cut, thro cut road, uh, or shortcut, through to uh, uh, through the graveyard. And of course, lo and behold, just as I cut into the graveyard, I seen the Witch of Big Interval, or what I thought was the Witch of Big Interval. And of course, she had on a long black coat, and she was old, and so forth. So I started running through the graveyard, and I didn't like going through the graveyard at that age either. So uh, anyway, I made it into my uncle's house, and when I got in there, my Aunt Maggie, she was sorting the mail. She was the postmistress, and uh, she had my lunch already on the table. So I went and I sat down, and no sooner sat down and opens the door, and who walks in but the witch? And I was sure, I was sure I was done. But anyway, she, uh, I learned that she was just a, a next door neighbor, older lady, Kate Dan was her name, and. Uh, uh, she was harmless, but uh, I was sure if she had got a hold of me that day, I wouldn't have made it to to uh, Huey McKinnon's. Yeah, a child's imagination is something else, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. How old were you when your uncle disappeared? Uh, I wasn't born when my uncle disappeared. Okay. My uncle disappeared in 1912. Okay. Uh, I was born in 1950. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it was a long time ago would yeah. die. Um, the idea for the book seems to get started with memories at your father's funeral. Is that uh, correct? Well, actually, no. Uh, it started, I'll tell you, the year it really started was in 1988. It was the winter of 1988, and I was home for a week. It must have been March break or something. And one night, uh, it was just my father and I, and my mother and my wife and I, and we were, I got him going on the old stories. And then when he came up, I asked him, I said, you know, well, what about Uncle Llewellyn? You know, tell me the story about that thing. Eh? So he started right away, got into the story. And I, up, up until that time, I didn't know much about it. And by this time, I'm 38 years old, right? So, but anyway, that night, I went to bed, and I was laying there, and I was thinking about it and thinking about it. So I, and when I got home, I started looking at different stories uh, about missing children. I think in them days, there was a show on TV called Unsolved Mysteries, and there used to be numerous stories, and that really got me going on it. So I, I started collecting information on the story, eh? and uh, then I interviewed people. In the summer of 88, I interviewed a lot of people on it, and it really uh, became clear to me the, that uh, the feelings were very strong from uh, people who had grown up in that era about it, about his disappearance and so forth. And, uh, so it developed from there, really. Up until that point, it was just uh, my first recollection of it was when I was, we were out playing in the, uh, the woodlands in the area, and my cousin had said something about uh, a boy had, that disappeared, you know, and he was probably in one of these big sinkholes that were playing around, eh? and different things like that. And, you know, you never paid much attention to it. Eh? But I really got interested in it when I was at the age of 38 years old, yeah. Well, as I said in the introduction, there are very several uh, different scenarios that uh, you 
talk about in your book. Yeah. Uh, you know, was he uh, was he murdered? Was he uh, taken away by an eagle? Uh, maybe you can address some of those uh, scenarios that uh, you were went through during your investigation of this thing. Well, see, the first person I talked to was my father, and I really got a good line on it. But uh, I have to realize he was 13 years old when he found out about it. He was, uh, you know, he was in school, and what got him going on it was kids in those days, they were talking at noon hour about the, the different families. There were some large families, and uh, when it came to him talking about his family, he went through the whole family, and all of a sudden, one girl mentioned to him, she said, well, what about your brother that's missing, eh? And uh, he said, what do you mean, my brother that's missing? And she said, yeah. She said, your brother is, he disappeared, you know, when he was a young child. Oh, he said, no, that can't be, he said. Um, so anyway, she said, yes, it is. And she said, actually, my uncle was was suspected of kidnapping him. And he said, no way, he said. So anyway, he uh, ran home, and uh, he found out that day. My, my grandmother sat him down, told him the story, and like she said, we don't know what happened, she said. She said, there are people who think he was kidnapped, but she said, I would like to believe he was lost or drowned in the river and died, because that way we know that he was all right, you know, one way or the other. Eh? But, uh, and that's where it started from there. So then after that, I went and I interviewed uh, my Aunt Hattie. She was the one that was with him, and she gave me her account of it, and she, and um, you mentioned the little boy Gullah, that was his nickname. It was given to him because he couldn't, uh, he had a speech impediment and he couldn't talk too well, and he used that word Gullah, so they nicknamed him Gullah. And uh, he was a very smart little fellow, according to her, uh, but with the exception of his speech. And uh, he had an awful fear of water. That was one thing that was very interesting. Very, had a real strong fear of water. And the kids used to, uh, the older kids used to sometimes uh, try to push him into a mud puddle, you know, and, and that, and uh, he would just scream and holler. He didn't want to go near the put and mud puddle and things like that. So. Um, Anyway, that's why I always wondered if he really wandered off to the river, you know. But uh, all indications were that he went, roamed away from the river, according to where the the rocking arm chair uh, was found. It was headed in an opposite direction. Eh? But uh, then the eagle, the story of the eagle, we were all, and that was another thing, when we were kids, small kids, I, I can always remember, you know, we'll stay close to the house, you know, an eagle could uh, come, and get, come and get you, you know. So different little things like that uh, uh, really intrigued me, you know, when I was looking into it. But then I went outside the family after that, I went to the, my next door neighbors, Willie and Gladys Ross. And there are, all these people are deceased now, eh? but uh, when I brought it, it up to them, the very, the very first thing, I just asked them about a certain individual, and boy, the whole story just came out the way they felt about it, you know, and they had strong feelings onto his disappearance as, as that would lead to a kidnapping or whatever, eh? abduct a child. Um, and then I went on from there. Then I went to different, differing people who had no connection to the family, but their names had come up, you know, and so I interviewed them, and I interviewed people who were distant relatives of the man who was suspected of kidnapping him. But anyway, it's like I say, you know, the oral, oral stories, when I, you look at the oral oral stories. Some are true and some are not true. Some are very well fabricated 
And so being in the days where there was no entertainment, there are a lot of oral, oral stories that you have to take with a grain of salt. And it's always been my own opinion when I look at it that this story, it could have been fabricated, you know, because of, and each time it's told, it gets better and better, you know. And uh, it's like any oral stories. People keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. And over the years, there's a lot of things. But they, everybody that I talked to all had the same opinion when they were done telling the story. They, they had one conclusion, and I would say, well, why do you believe that happened, you know? And Which was what? what, what was the, uh, that he was abducted and taken away, yeah. Uh, my grandparents had done a lot of searching. Uh, there was a number of clues that led them to follow up on. And even later years, um, my aunts and uncles down in the States, they even hired investigators down there to go um, on, to do a little research into uh, individuals, but nothing was ever turned up. Eh? So it, it's, you know, you have to really take it with a grain of salt, and it's possible he was abducted. It's possible that he might have lived a good life, it was suspected that he was taken from one family to another, and then eventually they left the area and never heard tell off again. Uh, that's possible, but it's a strong possibility. There were, the water was high that time of year, too. It's the spring of the year. That, actually, that, the night, that night, the water was quite high, although they had netted the river off and so forth. But the river was searched... Uh, for days afterwards, all along, right down, right down to East Margaree here, in fact, you know. And uh, nothing was found, you know, regarding his body at all. There was a, a scenario in the book where this fellow uh, uh, who didn't like to pay taxes. Yeah. I, and I think his name was John Norman. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, I used the nickname Peter John Norman because uh, if you'd have to do a lot of research to find out who he was. And where nicknames was a big thing, right? Okay. And like, uh, well, well, example, if at them days, our family was big. You know, the Tingleys, there was three... Tingley families in the area at that time, and there was a fair number, so everybody had nicknames. So, if you really wanted to do any search, you'd have to really search it out today. It'd be like if you were trying to find find uh, a nickname for the Phillipses or the Rosses. Well, you could come up with umpteen different scenarios to discover who it was. So I used Peter John Norman because that was his name. But uh, his real name, we'll leave it as history. Everybody knew him as Peter John Norman. And uh, so that's where it comes from. And he had a history of uh, not wanting to pay taxes. Yeah, yeah. And there were two occasions where uh, I think his name was Constable McLean from Inverness. He, that was his duty was to go and collect uh, taxes and generally they would seize a cow or or take a horse or whatever it was a but uh on two different occasions he had to go to this man's place and my grandfather was um a collector of taxes i guess it was for the school and that's where he encountered the problem and uh um it wasn't a pretty scene he didn't want to pay his taxes and uh they were a little play with guns and so forth and uh my anyway my grandfather managed to get the cow and they paid the taxes and uh, but he did make a threat to my grandfather that morning and uh but he just shrugged it off 
But, you know, the interesting thing was when he died in 1954 on his deathbed, he, he said to uh, my aunt who was there, he said to her, he said, you know, he said, I shouldn't have been so stubborn. He said, I should not have made him pay the taxes. He was still, even up to his death, he was still regretting what he had done. He, that's uh, there was a connection with him, and the <clears throat> fact that he killed the child because as a revenge, yeah, uh, over having to pay those taxes, which is rather, yeah. I I wouldn't. I don't think in the book I ever indicate that it was murder. I think we always want to believe that it was. Uh, he was abducted and taken away as family, but. After I had wrote the book, there was an individual who came forward to me. She was still living, and she told me that her father firmly believed that he, this man had taken him and killed him and buried him somewhere along the, one of the old roads there, the old roads. That was her. Actually, she was in tears when she told me that. Really? It seems like there was a lot of work done. I mean, they uh, took spears and went down to the river and into yeah. the sandbanks, and they did yeah. uh, netting along the river. Yeah. As, as you said, they came all the way down to East Marguerite, and mm -hmm. they did find some clothing down there, but I guess later on it wasn't his, is no, that correct? No, it wasn't his, no. It was, I think they knew it wasn't his anyway. It definitely wasn't his, and whose it was, they don't really know. Away. The interesting thing about the, 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 all the drownings that have taken place in the river right from back in the early 1800s, all, all the bodies were found. Yes, yeah. His body is the only one that was never found. Eh? Even the disappearance of people, uh, there was a woman who disappeared one winter in the big interval area in the middle of a winter storm. And they went out looking for her, and of course they couldn't find her. But the next spring they found her. She was sitting by a tree, and she froze to death in the middle of the storm. Eh? Wow. Yeah, yeah you, went, you did mention in the book that up to 1961, I think it was, there were 10 people that drowned in the area. Probably. And like you said, uh, they were all found. Yeah. Except yeah. if he went to the river, then uh, he was the only one that wasn't found. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because of his fear of water, the conjecture is that he probably didn't go yeah. to the river. Yeah. So uh, why wasn't the RCMP called in over this? I don't think uh, the RCMP was called in. Furthermore, they just figured at first he just roamed off and got lost. And... Uh, uh, by the time that r rumors started to get around about his missing thing, his missing uh, body or whatever, uh, gossip in the community resurfaced as to what had happened over the tax collection thing. And then uh, what really got it going was there was a, my grandfather had two brothers that lived down in Cape North. One was a school teacher and the other fellow was a, uh, he ran a general store down there. And there was suspicion by a family down there about a child. And they wrote my grandfather and they said, for him to come down, you know. So he he went down to Cape North, and uh, he did approach the family that was there. But he was quite satisfied that there was no child at that time uh, when he was there, and he knew the people. And but they did leave the area not long afterwards, and it was always it was just a one of those things that. Was it rumor? Who knows? It's it's yeah. it's hard to say. But they did go, and you know, uh, I think it was a uh, thirteen years later. Uh, another person wrote them from Cape North, and they said there was a, a foster child down there in the area, 
both the same age, and uh, they wanted him to go down and have a to see for really? his child. So he went down, and he had a, of course, the missing boy. He had a um, a defect in one eye. It was a there's a medical term for it, and I can't remember what it is now. But he had a uh, in the his eye. He had a um, a pigment that was brown, dark brown. Uh, many people have them. Eh? Like his eyes were blue, but he had a dark pigment that I think it was in the left eye. So that was one of the always things he watched for, you know. And uh, when he went to see this child, that was the first thing he looked for. And there was no pigment in his eye, and there was no reason for him to suspect that it was his child. But it did. Uh, it did. Uh, it was always on their mind, it, uh, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. It's a lost child. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I understand the, uh, the book now, The Cold Case of Portree, is out of print? It's out of print, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting story, yeah. for sure. And my understanding is also that you have another book on the shelves now. Yeah. Uh, it's called Rivulet? Yeah, yeah. It's a little Stream, I guess that's what... Uh, the past lives of rivulet because actually the community that uh, that part of port tree on the on the east side of the river was known as rivulet okay. and then on the west side it was port tree but oh, eventually see, it okay. all became port tree yeah okay. yeah and that one there was on an uncle who had disappeared for many years oh, really and then he just came back when they just showed up at home like he had never left, you know. But then he had a whole life that uh, we knew very little about. And and so over the years, I was able to collect the information, like from his family in the States and so forth. And, yeah, put it together. Okay, where can you get those books? Uh, right now, it's mainly at the co-op in Marguerite. Uh, I had... And in a few bookstores, but uh, it's mostly from the co-op and the Dancing Goat, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, we, we're going to have to leave it there. But I really want to thank you for sharing uh, your story with our listeners this morning. But before I go, I would like to read a verse from a poem in your book, written by your Aunt Hattie, who perhaps was the last person, as far as we know, who saw your missing uncle. And it describes poignantly, I think, the lost child's mother's feelings. The broken-hearted mother waits and has waited for many a year for tidings of the little lad whose memory she holds so dear. With longing heart and tear-dimmed eyes, she looks at the Viking chair. She likes to think of her child as dead and in God's tender care. Thank you to our listeners this morning. And a reminder to hit the like and subscribe buttons so you can stay up to date. And remember, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. So long for now. Pat.